he leaves for Hong Kong. And a few mo uh, months later, he passes away. And, uh, and I, I was shocked. We know Bruce Lee as the legendary martial artist credited with bringing Chinese martial arts to Western audiences and making it a permanent staple of cinema. However, at the young age of 32, in 1973, Bruce Lee suddenly died, right on the verge of becoming an international superstar. What did fans not know about him that made his death so mysterious? What is the shocking truth about the legendary actor that his former sparring partner, colleague, and friend, 83-year-old Chuck Norris, felt he had to tell everyone? If you're as curious as we are, let's find the answer to these questions as we look into the life of the iconic martial legend. Bruce Lee was born Lee Jun Fan on November 27, 1940, in San Francisco, California, in both the hour and year of the dragon. He was the fourth child of his parents. His family consisted of his father, Lee Hoi Chuen, a Cantonese opera singer, his mother, Grace Lee, who had Chinese-German heritage, and his three older siblings. They all lived in Hong Kong, but moved to California for an international opera tour in Chinatown, San Francisco, in 1939. This was where Bruce was born. During his birth, his father was away in New York for a performance. So, his mother named him Bruce, which meant strong one, in Gaelic, thanks to advice from her physician. It was a name his father wasn't pleased with, so his family didn't use it during his preschool years. Even at a young age, he was destined for greatness, already changing the way Chinese people were presented in American films. His father, who was also a part-time actor, was quick to introduce baby Bruce to the entertainment industry. And his first film would be when he was three months old, standing in for an American baby in the movie Golden Gate Girl. In April 1941, he was taken back to Hong Kong by the time he was four months old. But the family faced some unexpected hardships as Japan, in the midst of World War II, launched a surprise attack on Hong Kong in December 1941. They ruled the city for the next four years. While Hong Kong was recovering, nine-year-old Bruce had already co-starred with his father in two movies, The Birth of Mankind in 1946 and The Kid in 1950. The Kid in 1950 was his first leading role, and it was based on a comic book character. Bruce's parents didn't allow him to miss school, so he was enrolled in Taksun School, which was close to home. At 12, he started at the primary school division of the Catholic La Salle College. As Bruce grew older, he was frequently cast as a teen thug in many more movies. These probably affected him because, as a teen, he joined a street gang and was involved in several street fights. After sustaining an injury in one of his fights, his parents decided that he needed to be trained in martial arts to defend himself better. In 1953, William Chung, a friend of his, introduced Bruce to Yip Man, an expert in Wing Chun Kung Fu. But Bruce was rejected because of the ancient Chinese rule that stops foreigners from being taught the martial arts. His European heritage was the major reason for his rejection. Eventually, Chung spoke on his behalf and Bruce began learning Wing Chun Kung Fu from Yip Man. However, a year into his Wing Chun training, the majority of other students refused to train with him because of his mixed ancestry. Bruce decidedly remained focused on his training, taking private lessons from Yip Man and sparring with Chiung and Wang Shun Liung. This focus would help Bruce greatly as it kept him from fighting in Hong Kong's street gangs. As an outlet for his students, Yip Man entered them into recognized and organized competitions. There was one other issue. In 1956, due to his poor academic performance, Bruce was transferred to St. Francis Xavier's College. At his new college, his teacher was Brother Edward Muse, F.M.S., a Bavarian and coach of the school boxing team. Bruce would add boxing to his increasing range of fighting styles, and in 1958, he won the Hong Kong School Boxing Tournament. To secure his win, he ended up knocking out his final opponent, who was the previous champion. Bruce also discovered he was pretty good in some other areas, winning Hong Kong's Crown Colony Cha-Cha Championship and becoming known for his poetry. But his street fights had not stopped. In fact, he was now so involved in gang issues, he was fighting the son of a feared triad family. In 1958, 
He fought on a rooftop after students from a rival Choi Li Foot martial arts school challenged the Wing Chun school. In another case, Bruce beat a boy who was at fault. He knocked out one of his teeth, leading to a complaint by the boy's parents to the police. Bruce's mother had to sign a document at the police station stating that she would be responsible for her son's actions from then on. Bruce's father remained in the dark about that whole episode while his mother looked for an opportunity to take him to the U.S. The opportunity would come sooner than she thought, as Bruce was about to turn 18. Thanks to the fact that his academic performance was not improving and the need to claim his U.S. citizenship, Bruce left Hong Kong for the U.S. By 18, Bruce had achieved much, appearing in about 20 Hong Kong movies. Bruce arrived in the U.S. in 1959 and initially stayed with his elder sister Agnes Lee, who was staying with family friends in San Francisco. Some months later, he moved to Seattle to continue his high school education, working part-time at a restaurant belonging to Ruby Chow, the wife of his father's friend. Bruce was a live-in waiter at her restaurant. That same year, he started to teach martial arts, creating his own style of kung fu, called Jun Fan Gung Fu, which was his personal approach to Wing Chun. His Seattle friends, starting with judo practitioner Jesse Glover and Taki Kimura, were some of his original students. Bruce eventually opened his first martial arts school in Seattle, named the Lee Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute. After completing high school, he received his diploma from Edison Technical School on Capitol Hill in Seattle. By 1961, he was at the University of Washington studying philosophy, psychology, and dramatic arts, which was his major. He was also fond of some other subjects, which he also took time to study. Three years later, he dropped out of university and moved to Oakland to stay with an older Chinese martial artist named James Yim Lee, who was well known in the area. Together, they founded another Jun Fan martial arts studio in Oakland. This was around the time he met and married Linda Emery. At this point, he owned martial arts schools in California, Los Angeles, and Oakland. James introduced Bruce to Ed Parker, an American martial artist. This connection would start to build the legend of Bruce Lee. Ed invited Bruce to the 1964 Long Beach International Karate Championships. Here, he did three very significant things. Firstly, using his thumb and the index finger of one hand, he performed repetitions of two-finger push-ups while placing his feet approximately shoulder-width apart. Secondly, he did what was named the one-inch punch. Standing upright, his right foot was forward with knees a little bent, his right arm was partly extended, and his right fist was approximately one inch away from the volunteer's chest. Without pulling back his right arm, Bruce then threw a punch, still maintaining his posture. This punch forced the volunteer to fall backward to the floor. The volunteer, Bob Baker, recalled, I told Bruce not to do this type of demonstration again. When he punched me that last time, I had to stay home from work because the pain in my chest was unbearable. This was where he met Chuck Norris, who himself was the winner of the Long Beach International Karate Championships. Chuck recalls that Bruce just beckoned to him, and they talked, sharing ideas and experiences. According to Chuck, they spent almost nine hours talking. Right from that moment, they became friends despite the differences in ethnicity and fighting style. Bruce met more fighting experts like Taekwondo master Jun Gu Ri. Some of these meetings would be of mutual respect and end up benefiting both parties. For example, Chuck and Bruce would end up training together for two whole years. In fact, Chuck claimed that he had convinced Bruce to change his philosophy on high kicks during training, a change Bruce would eventually make and start using in movies, as you would have noticed. However, not every person Bruce meets is like Chuck, who spreads positivity. Bruce himself was a man who believed a lot in his abilities, and for good reason too. And occasionally he met people like Wong Jackman, a direct student of Ma Kin Fung, known for his mastery of Xing Yi Quan, Tai Chi, and Northern Shaolin. At times like these, the two egos become too big to exist in close proximity. In 1964, the Chinese community in Oakland's Chinatown demanded that Bruce stop teaching non-Chinese people martial arts, something he refused to comply with. So to put the matter to rest, he challenged Wong to a private match. The terms were, if he lost, he would close down his school, and if he won, nobody would question his decision to teach foreigners martial arts. When asked, 
He claimed that he wasn't aware of any agreement on the table. His only request was to fight Bruce for boasting at a Chinatown theater that he could beat anyone in San Francisco. Wong also cleared the air about discrimination, saying he doesn't discriminate between whites or other non-Chinese people. Bruce said concerning the community's discrimination, that paper had all the names of the Sifu from Chinatown, but they don't scare me. Clearly, he wanted people to know that Wong wasn't telling the complete truth. On the day of the fight, there were two witnesses, Cadwell, James Lee, and William Chen, a Tai Chi teacher. Wong and Chen would later state that the fight lasted for less than 30 minutes. Wong explained that for the traditional handshake, Bruce deceived him into thinking he was about to accept the greeting, but instead allegedly thrust his hand as a spear aimed at Wong's eyes. He continued, stating that though it was supposed to be a serious, respectful fight, Bruce was intent on killing him, and so he fought back. And Wong believed he could have killed Bruce if he had capitalized on an opportunity that presented itself. His reason for taking a chance was that it could have earned him a prison sentence. However, according to Cadwell and James, the other two witnesses, the fight lasted three minutes, and Bruce won. Cadwell said, The fight ensued. It was a no-holds-barred fight. It took three minutes. Bruce got this guy down to the ground and said, Do you give up? And the man said, He gave up. Weeks later, Bruce, during an interview, claimed he won a fight, but didn't give the name of the person he defeated. Wong, of course, knew he was talking about him, and he was not going to keep quiet. So he wrote in a Chinese-language newspaper in San Francisco, the Pacific Weekly, an account of what happened during his fight with Bruce, and even invited him to a public rematch if Bruce felt he was lying about his account. However, Bruce didn't reply to Wong's published letter since the Chinese community had stopped bothering him about teaching foreigners. He had already achieved his goal. Another goal was to return to the movie screen, and this would be achieved too, in a shocking way. During a martial arts exhibition in Long Beach, television producer William Dozier saw potential in Bruce during the audition for a role in the pilot for Number One Son about Lee Chan, the son of Charlie Chan. The show was never aired, but Bruce took some joy in his son Brandon, who was born in 1965. Dozier eventually offered the role of Cato to Bruce in the TV series, The Green Hornet, which was produced and narrated by William Dozier. The series was based on the radio show, which had the same name. The show's director initially wanted Bruce to fight in the normal American style, but since he was a professional martial artist, Bruce refused. He then made his point known by insisting that it made more sense to fight in the style of his training. Bruce was actually moving so fast on set that the cameras couldn't keep up with him, so he had to slow his movements down to get it on film. The Green Hornet became the first popular American show that truly showed Asian-style martial arts. The show ran from September 1966 to March 1967, a total of 26 episodes making a full season. Brew was co-starring with Van Williams on The Green Hornet. When that ended, he and Williams would maintain their roles in three crossover episodes of Batman, which were produced by Dozier. This was the return to the American cinema Bruce left when he was a baby. While on set, Bruce made friends, and one of them was Gene LaBelle, a stuntman on the show. They spared and exchanged martial arts knowledge from their different expertise. The show ended in 1967, Bruce was quick to thank Dozier, saying in a letter that Dozier had single-handedly started his career in show business. For Bruce, he welcomed his daughter, Shannon. This was clearly the start of something new. After The Green Hornet, Bruce was influenced by the Wong fight, believing the fight took too long. Personally, he felt he had failed to live up to his potential, using his Wing Chun techniques. His conclusion was that traditional martial arts techniques were formalized to be useful in practical street fights. Bruce created a system that focused on practicality, flexibility, speed, and efficiency. He started to use different training methods, incorporating running for endurance, stretching for flexibility, weight training for strength, fencing, and basic boxing techniques. So, his former style, Jun Fan Gung Fu, which he had concluded was too traditional, evolved into Jeet Kune Do, or the way of the intercepting fist. For him, this was the style of no style, to exist outside of limitations. 
but calling it Jeet Kune Do did not do this new system justice, given that Jeet Kune Do meant that there were certain factors that still limited the styles. A second film that didn't see the light of day during this period was The Silent Flute. Two of Bruce's martial arts students were Hollywood scriptwriter Sterling Siliphant and actor James Coburn. In 1969, the three started working on the script for the film, even going to India to secure its location. But it all fell through, and the movie was never realized. Someone else, however, used the plot of the film and produced the 1978 film, Circle of Iron, starring David Carradine. Bruce wasn't deterred by the failure of The Silent Flute in 1969. He was in Siliphant's film Marlowe, playing a brief part as a thug hired to intimidate private detective Philip Marlowe, played by James Garner. Bruce was also credited as the karate advisor in the fourth part of the Matt Helm comedy spy-fi film starring Dean Martin, The Wrecking Crew. Also, in the same year, he was in one episode of Here Come the Brides and Blondie. The following year, he was saddled with the responsibility of producing the fight choreography for A Walk in the Spring Rain, a movie written by Siliphant and starring Ingrid Bergman and Anthony Quinn. In 1971, Bruce again worked with Siliphant in the four episodes of the television series Long Street. Here, Bruce was Lee Tsung, the martial arts instructor of the main character Mike Longstreet, played by James Franciscus. The brilliance of this movie was that the important aspects of Bruce's martial arts philosophy would be incorporated into the script. This probably gave Bruce some motivation to pitch a TV series of his own, titled The Warrior, and Warner Bros. even confirmed discussions. But Bruce later reported that both Paramount and Warner Brothers wanted him to be in a modernized type of a thing, and that they think the Western idea is out, whereas I want to do the Western. Some people believe, including Cadwell, that Bruce's idea was used by Warner Bros. in their Kung Fu, and they gave Bruce no credit. Of course, Warner Bros. stated that their writer and producer, Ed Spielman and Howard Friedlander, had developed Kung Fu's concept in 1969. Another role that wasn't given to Bruce was the role of the Shaolin monk in the Wild West, which was played by a non-martial artist, David Carradine. Bruce, in response to not being cast, said, They think that business-wise, it is a risk. I don't blame them. If the situation were reversed, and an American star were to come to Hong Kong, and I was the man with the money, I would have my own concerns as to whether the acceptance would be there. Bruce was clearly unhappy with the supporting roles he was getting in Hollywood. So, listening to the advice of a few friends, including producer Fred Weintraub, he told Chuck he was going to Hong Kong. He took his craft to Asia, with a plan to make a movie for his portfolio, which he could present to the big guys in Hollywood. It was when he got to Hong Kong, he realized he was already a star. The Green Hornet was locally referred to as The Kato Show, with the people seeing Kato, the character he played as the star of the show. So, jumping on this new-found opportunity, he signed a contract with Golden Harvest to star in two films they will produce. Bruce's first big break was playing his first leading role in The Big Boss, which established him as a star after the movie became an instant success at box offices across Asia. But he was just starting. The following year, 1972, he released Fist of Fury, breaking the box office record set by The Big Boss. He negotiated a new deal now that his two-year contract with Golden Harvest was done. In the process, Bruce set up his own company, Concord Production Inc., a brilliant and timely move because he got complete control of the film's production as the writer, director, star, and choreographer of the fight scenes for his third film, The Way of the Dragon. With full creative control, Bruce called Chuck up to come and play his opponent in The Way of the Dragon. The role had originally been given to American karate champion Joe Lewis, but for some reason, Bruce remembered his friend Chuck, and when Chuck asked who was going to win the fight, Bruce would famously reply, I am the star. Perhaps a joke between friends, but we do know that in an earlier interview, Bruce had said fighting people like Joe Lewis, Mike Stone, and Chuck Norris would be easy as if he was fighting children. Their almost 10-minute fight scene in the movie is regarded as one of the best fight scenes in martial arts and film history. Chuck, in an interview, even said, I enjoyed working with Bruce Lee in the film. It was a lot of fun. 
The fight scene is considered the classic martial arts fight scene of all time, so it's nice to be involved in a fight scene that everyone loves. After Fist of Fury made an initial $100 million, The Way of the Dragon grossed an estimated $130 million worldwide. Late in 1972, Bruce started working on a new film, Game of Death, which was also to be produced by his company. At this time, Bruce was already a superstar in Asia. For Game of Death, he had started his fight progression with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, also an old student and a famous American athlete. However, production was stopped when Warner Brothers allowed Bruce to star in another movie, Enter the Dragon. This movie was the one that put Bruce on the map in the US and Europe. But a few months after production was completed and six days after the movie's release, on July 26, 1973, Bruce died at the age of 32. On May 10, 1973, he was unconscious at the Golden Harvest Studios while busy with Enter the Dragon. He was rushed to the Hong Kong Baptist Hospital and was diagnosed with cerebral edema. The doctors reduced the swelling and he was given a mannitol prescription. After this incident, Bruce went about his business and even went to places for meetings. During one of those, according to Linda, he met with an executive, Raymond Chow, at 2 cows p.m. to discuss the filming of Game of Death which he had stopped for Enter the Dragon. The meeting lasted for two hours, after which Bruce and Linda went to the house of Betty Ting, an actress from Taiwan who works with him. Later, Bruce complained of a mild headache and was given Equigesic, a painkiller, which had aspirin and meprobamate. This was around 7.30 in the evening, so he laid down for a light sleep. When he did not show up for dinner, Raymond looked to awaken him, but Bruce would not answer. Raymond immediately called for a doctor, who spent some minutes trying to wake Bruce up before rushing him to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. However, he died upon reaching the hospital. According to the autopsy, there were no observable external injuries, but his brain had distended significantly, from 1,400 to 1,175 gree, a 13% rise. The only material found in his body was the painkillers Ting had given him. The doctors had ruled Bruce's death as death by adventure. Bruce was buried at Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, Washington. Chuck had received Bruce's death with a heavy heart, but would continue to speak great things of his friend many years after Bruce's death. In fact, when Linda, Bruce's wife, returned to the U.S. with the children, they stayed in the same area Chuck was staying, and he was quick to reach out to comfort the family. Chuck even ensured he was there as a father figure for Bruce's children, telling Brandon especially of great his father was. Even at an old age, Chuck still speaks in praise of Bruce, some 50 years after his death. And when an allegation of Bruce being on enhancement drugs during his career arose, 83-year-old Chuck wasn't going to keep quiet while they smeared the good name his friend left behind. So he revealed Bruce's cause of death to clear doubts and any confusion. He explained that when Bruce made a decision to develop his own unique fighting style, one of the major things he started was lifting weights. He recalled that on one of those days, Bruce had overlifted and it had broken a disc in his back. He was on the hospital bed for three weeks. Everyone had feared that Bruce might never walk again, but through the tenacity of which he had plenty, three months later, he was fine. The only issue was Bruce had to remain on medication for the constant back pain he was now suffering. Fast forward to Bruce's death. Chuck revealed that the medication for his back pain reacted with the me probamate that was present in the equagesic he took for his headache. The hypersensitivity of these two caused a swelling in his brain, leading to an aneurysm, also known as acute cerebral edema. We get that should put the rumors to rest. However, one cannot deny that Bruce Lee, though he lived a very short life, made the most significant impact in the history of martial arts in cinema. Enter the Dragon became one of the year's top-grossing films. Since its release, the movie has grossed more than 200 million, and it cemented Bruce as a martial arts superstar.